There's a reason why Xtrades is currently the fastest growing application on the market for sharing financial ideas. With over $2.5 million paid in the last two years to contributors, users are flocking to see what trades the top traders on the leaderboard are sharing in real time. If you're looking to grow your reputation as a trader on the internet or discuss your trading ideas with other reputable investors, click the link below and get connected with the trading mentor today, completely free of charge. All right, what's up, everybody? This is Alex from X Trades back to you with another weekly trade ideas list. I hope everybody had a wonderful trading week last week. We had a pretty choppy week for the most part until Friday. I would say the market overall went up, lots of higher lows getting put in, but we did go through a consolidation phase and we didn't break out until Friday. We had a really big day on Friday and that kind of just aligned with the seasonality. We already had that big rally at the beginning of the month. And then towards the midpoint in November, we kind of started to get that consolidation and then it sees a dip towards the end of the month and then a big rally towards the actual end of the month up into December. So a pretty interesting week. Nice continuation from the week prior, really big rally. So we definitely needed that consolidation. I wasn't expecting it just to go straight up. I don't think a lot of people were. So a little bit more hesitancy to buy up there. And that's when you start seeing choppy price action, more hesitation, more consolidation and accumulation before it starts to rally higher. So before we get into our setups, let's go ahead and get into the economic calendar real quick. We do have some pretty big data this week. So Monday, it's just Fed Governor Lisa Cook speaking and then the US federal budget. Don't think this is going to be a factor in the market market at all. Tuesday, most important day of the week, a couple of Fed speakers also have the consumer price index, CPI, most important data of the week. We really want to see inflation start coming down to know that the Fed tightening is working, Fed rate hikes are working, and maybe we can definitely come to the conclusion that they are pausing for good. They're not going to do another hike and that'd be good for the market. Although I think the market has already priced that in pretty heavily. So got to be careful with that. So the CPI is going to be the most important of the week. Definitely keep that on your radar. Definitely wouldn't trade it personally. At least swinging short-term contracts through big events like this can be a lot more risky. And if you really do want to hold through these events, you need to buy time on your contracts. Keep it simple. Don't stress yourself out. And then Wednesday, another inflation gauge for the producer side. We do have the producer price index core PPI, PPI year over year, and core PPI year over year. So this is going to be the second most important data set of the week. And then we also have U.S. retail sales as well. Another one that can potentially move the market, but I don't think it's going to really matter all that much when the PPI comes out. Everybody's paying attention to the PPI. The Empire State Manufacturing Survey, this can move the market if it comes in by itself. But like I said, we have retail sales and PPI coming out, and this is all at 830. So just pay attention to the PPI. We want to see the inflation coming down on the producer side as well. And then business inventories at 10, that's a hit or mess if it's going to move the market. And then more Fed speakers, so just lots of Fed speakers this week. Then you see we have more Fed speakers, usual initial jobless claims, also the Philadelphia Fed manufacturing survey. This can move the market. It's a hit or miss. Need to see an extreme reading for it to move the market. Market doesn't really care too much about this one. And then just more Fed speakers, lots and lots of Fed speakers, like I said. And then Friday is the same thing, just more Fed speakers. Uh, building permits, housing starts. This doesn't usually move the market, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to it or expect any big moves from the market on this. The Fed speakers can definitely move us. It just depends on how the language is looking, either hawkish or dovish. And before we get into the setups, let's go ahead and go over the seasonality real quick. Last week, we were coming up into the midpoint almost of the month. We kind of start to see that consolidation. Well, now coming into this week, we're actually going to be in the midpoint of the month. So I would expect maybe a little bit of chop, especially after that breakout we saw. S&P looks pretty good at a big downtrend line, but broke over a major resistance point. So maybe it can get over that downtrend line. We'll have to see. I could definitely see it stalling out a little bit here. Even with the seasonality, that kind of puts everything into perspective as well. After such a big rally like this, I mean, it's just usual. The market starts slowing down a little bit. Volatility goes down. Even the dips get smaller. So you can still buy them. Buying the dips works really good uh, in low VIX environments. They usually get bought back up pretty quick. And that's what we've seen for the last two weeks. So that's what it looks like it'll be this week. Obviously, the CPI and the PPI can move us and make us volatile. But until we start seeing that volatility come back, I really wouldn't expect too much of a big dip. And we need to see that VIX get over 1550s and start closing over that for that dip to kind of get a little bit bigger. And we actually rejected off it last week and we'll go over that later. So seasonality coming up into the midpoint of the month. Could be a little bit choppy according to history, but you never know with the data. Also need to break out of that downtrend line on the actual spy chart. So the seasonality is just hinting at potential chop. It's nothing to take literally, but just something to maybe expect just based off of history and past performance. 
And for the setups this week, our first one, we're going to go ahead and go over UNG. This is natural gas. It's probably the best thing you could trade in terms of stock for natural gas. Or if you want to trade the natural gas futures, you can do the NG as well. But this is probably your best option. There's another one called Boyle, but it's a leveraged ETF. And it slowly decays and loses value just due to rollovers because they have exposure to futures contracts. And honestly, UNG is just the best thing you're going to get without too much decaying and a little bit less risk. So for UNG, it's simple. This is going to be a more probably a two month type play just due to seasonality. As everybody knows, when winter comes around, demand for natural gas can go up. It's cold outside. People want to use more heat. UNG is looking a little bit oversold here. Obviously, it's been pretty much chopping ever since April. It hasn't had a good return all year, and it's been a hit or miss pretty much for the last almost two years now. It's been in a very heavy downtrend bear market, and I kind of like it down at these levels, like this 650, if I can get back over that, that could be a good area to go long. As well as 610 right here, you got support here, support here, and as well as another one here at this low at 587. This is another good potential support that it's bounced from. So the 610 and 587 right now, if I can get down there, I'll be willing to buy the dip for calls. I'm going to be looking at January expiration just because this has kind of been a riskier play. It gets choppy. It's in a downtrend as well. So buying time on this to let the seasonal pattern maybe come back up, let that demand for winter come back up for natural gas. January could be a good expiration. So this is more of like a two month type play and you don't have to enter it right away or anything. If you want to wait for it to either get over 642, come down to 610 or get down to 587. That works as well. You can wait for one of those. And you got three different levels of focus. So you could either wait for it to start closing over 642 or dipping into these two below. It's as simple as that. And like I said, January expiration to deal with any chop, any downtrend, and any time that it needs to get into that seasonal pattern to the upside, let natural gas demand come back, etc. So UNG looking at calls, but further out, January expiration minimum. And next, we're going into snow here. This is a tech play. You can see it's actually poking out of this downtrend. Let's go to the four hour real quick. You can see it a little bit better. You got to test one. You got to test two, test three, four, five rejections, a couple rejections right here in this little structure. And then it finally poked out on Friday and actually closed outside of it. So I want to see if this can get any follow through on Monday and into next week. Obviously, if it starts going back within the downtrend, you can just throw it away, wait for it to get back outside and, you know, watch it later. But if it can open outside of this on Monday or, you know, just stay outside of the downtrend line, I feel good about it going a little bit higher. And then maximum, I got it up to, you know, this little supply up here. It's going to be at about 166. And that's also a wick high right here. We could add the wick high. It's going to be 166.40s. And that meets right with the supply zone right here on the one day. It's a pretty nice supply zone. It rejected from over here as well. So that's the only reason why that's probably the max I could see for now. I just have no idea how it's going to react up to supply. And when there's supply in the way, if you really want to hold past the supply, you need to buy time on your contracts to deal with any drawdown risk, to deal with any rejection risk. That's what you do if you have any supply risk above any supply zone resistance, anything. Time on contracts is what's going to deal with that. So that's the best way to go about it. If you do have a big supply zone in the way, we we're looking at WFC last week and WFC broke out as well, similar to this, but it had a supply just briefly above and actually rejected off the supply. I think WFC still looks good. So if you want to go check that out, check out the last video, it's actually at a better spot to buy than what we were looking at last week. We had a couple other good setups last week. Two of them played out and then two of them didn't. Well, I guess you could say NVIDIA puts kind of did if you took the puts off the downtrend line for just a scalp. It was just a scalp focus last week for puts because volatility is so low. You don't want to overstay your welcome with shorts. So that's why it was the only put play last week. And we had majority looking at calls last week. Airbnb uh, took profit on those. I bought the dip first thing on Monday and sold it on Tuesday. Made almost 30% on that. Even though it, it didn't get above our level, still played out pretty good. And then Google as well filled some of that gap we we're looking for on the calls for upside. So pretty good week last week. Hopefully this week will be good as well. Hopefully these setups will be nice. Like I said, UNG, I would definitely just buy time and then snow over here. Just make sure it's staying outside the downtrend line. Keep it simple. If it can stay outside and follow through with this breakout, 166, 40 is maximum. And then you could probably take profit around there. If the contracts, you know, gain enough value, you could even take profit sooner. It doesn't have to get all the way up there to pay good. So that's for snow. Looking at calls, make sure it stays outside downtrend. If it starts going back within, just maybe look at something else or, you know, take it off your watch for a little bit. Wait for it to get back outside. So that's for snow. And number three, we're looking at Jay Blue here. We've actually had this on a video before, probably months ago. I think it was way up here. 
I think we were looking at this area or something at these supports and it had a pretty good day. I think it made like 4% on Monday and then it just went into a straight downturn after that. So you kind of had to be quick with that. This week, it's definitely way lower than it was from the last time I looked at it, but it has a really nice demand zone here. If you don't know, this is a drop base rally demand zone. It's exactly how it sounds. It has the big drop sellers, makes a base rally to the upside and with supply and demand you wait for it to return to the zone and then you can enter supply you know you can go short buy puts demand you can start looking for dip buys down here at the discount zone and your discount zone is going to be this demand zone right here this is a nice big red base candle makes it nice and wide from open down to wake low that's why the zone is so wide because of this one base candle right here and you can see on the one day already got a nice little wick reaction nothing crazy if we go down to the 15 minute you can see first initial wick at 9 30 big push up came back down again tried to hold up held up pretty good rallied a little bit up into close but still closed down you know almost three percent it's a pretty volatile name Definitely been getting smashed compared to other airlines, but the other airlines don't have the demand zone that this one does. So I really like how this looks in terms of risk to reward or RR. And then maximum, I could see if it can start bouncing off here, you can see it up to, you know, 434, which is these structure lows right here. You got a bottom here, bottom here, bottom here, just a short term bottom. Like I said, it's been in a downtrend. So obviously these supports or bounces are nothing crazy, but this is a structure. You got a small bounce here, you got a small bounce here, wick, small bounce there, another wick, small bounce. And then once it broke structure, that's when we got this big gap down, probably from earnings. And I had that huge buy imbalance to the upside, this one day bar up almost 12%. And then it retraced the whole thing. And now we're back at the discount or demand zone. That's why we want to look for calls, look for a potential bounce. If you want to wait for some type of one day bar to close and show that it's holding and reacted to the demand zone well, you could do that as well. You don't have to buy here. It may need to dip down a little bit lower before bouncing, but definitely just keep this on watch. Look for this whole general area. Even if it gets down here, gaps down on Monday, still look for this general area to eventually get a bounce maybe because this is a really nice demand zone that led almost to a 12% rally. So that's why it's a, it's a good good buy imbalance area and a really good demand zone in my opinion obviously all demand zones aren't going to pay but this one seems worth watching so j blue looking at calls maximum upside i could see 434 and then obviously risk off or invalidation if it starts going under 340 which is this wick low right here so keep it simple j blue looking at calls maybe see a little bit more patient on this one still on a downtrend moving averages you know still trending lower just had earnings so could need a little time but if airlines can get some juice here maybe with travel demand for holidays similar to ung starting to get more demand for natural gas and for heat same thing with travel and airlines people start traveling for the holidays you can start to see that demand increase so simple as that maybe keep a watch on it looking at calls be patient. All right. And last but not least for individual tickers, this is actually an ETF. So this is IWM. I usually have these in our, you know, index analysis, but I do want to look at a setup on this specifically. So we'll look at it as our last individual ticker here. So I was actually looking to buy this around, you know, 169, 170, but I just didn't like how it was holding up and it was really weak compared to the market. So small mid caps just were not doing good while the SPY was consolidating good. SPY was managing to still close green on some days, even if it wasn't big. And IWM was closing red and just trending down. Same with the equal weight index for the S&P. Equal weight index had a horrible week until Friday. IWM, small mid caps and equal weight were all trending lower while the SPY was still holding, tech was still holding. And that's likely just due to the weighting of you know apple microsoft all the big names basically just carrying the whole damn market and sometimes iwm and small and mid caps they can be a leading indicator and if you start seeing small mid caps go lower that can make people a little bit more skeptical about the large caps and the s p or tech either way spy qqq still held up good despite you know weakness in iwm or small mid caps and i feel like iwm is actually given an opportunity here so you could see this 169 comes from right here, this little area that I'm highlighting right here. And we close just a little bit over that 169. Another support it has is this 167.46. It's coming from right here, this area right here. So that 167.46 and that 169.09, 
from this area and this area and you can see it actually held up pretty good on friday we actually bounced off of it and that's what i'm keeping an eye on went just a little bit briefly over it but once we reclaimed it made a base off of it really nice shoot up market rallied and once it got over 168.50 that's when you had this big impulse candle and this continuation up so the close over 169 indicated a little bit of strength the only thing is we still have this big sale imbalance and you know just it almost looks like a consolidation bar that could go lower so that's why we want to see it staying over 169 maybe even open above 169 69, make a base off of it, or it could just shoot up, fill up the sell imbalance. But either way, looking for a move up to this 172, was that 172.80? Yeah, 172.80 flat. And that's the supply. It's a rally base drop supply. So the opposite of the J Blue demand we we're looking at, this is rally base drop. J Blue drop base rally. That's a big resistance big potential sell imbalance area, or at least a area that led to a big sell imbalance in this little downtrend right here from the past four days. And that's why that's the highest I can see it. But either way, could be making a little type of head and shoulders. Yeah, shoulder one, got a head. Now maybe you have the potential second shoulder trying to form and it'll bounce back up. So that could indicate some strength in the market if it can follow through with that. And as well, IWM just has way better risk to reward. So I like it better than SPY and QQQ. Simple as that. So that's for IWM. Make sure it's staying and holding over 167.46 minimum. And we want to see it over that 169, 170 for sure to get up to 172.80. Simple as that. Looking at calls. And on to the indexes. First one we go over every single week is SPY. So we're actually at a big downtrend line now. There's another way to draw it as well. Uh, you could do it like this. You come from this point, go to this point. You got test one, test two. You got a big red test three rejection right there. So there's a couple ways to draw it. And I'm sure multiple traders have drew it very differently. This is why technical analysis is subjective. There could be all different types of opinions on it. So either way, you got to test one, test two, test three. This would be a test four for the one that I'm looking at right now. And this is an overall down channel type of line. So we want to see it getting over that. And if it does get over that, it takes you straight into supply, which is the max I could see it. Honestly, that's going to be at 443. It's a drop base drop zone. So this area that I'm highlighting with my little green cursor here, this is the base that led to big selling. And as well, last week we had another kind of rally base drop zone. So it's rally base drop. And that's actually where we rejected at the top of the supply. So it traded through it just a little bit, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But once Thursday came, we did get that big rejection and then big rally the next day, able to break over the high at 438. So that's why that supply zone from last week is not there anymore because we started closing outside of it. Once you start closing outside of it, you can consider it void, consider it null, whatever you want. It's not as relevant anymore. And then you wait for a new supply or the next supply to get tapped. Another thing we were looking at last week, looking for either 433 flat or 430 flat to be able to buy the dip. Got really close to 433. So I had a low at 433.40. Didn't hit the 433 in the dot I was looking for, but I still bought dips all last week. If you go to app.xtrades.net, you'll see my day trades. I was basically buying dips all week and it worked pretty good. Had a very good week. I believe we bought this one on Wednesday, bought some calls for a day trade, got a nice scalp there. Uh, I think I scalped down here during Jerome Powell's speech, just a little quick 25% or something, bought this low, sold on this candle. And then Friday, I think we traded the QQQ. So it was just a pretty good week for dip buyers. I even got a little put scalp in on Friday, believe it or not, on the QQQ, nice and quick 20%er. So it was a really good week for day trading. I really liked it. I thought it was great for trading. The ranges were good. The price action was good. And despite low volatility, the option contracts were still moving good. Uh, low volatility also makes it easier to buy the dips and be a little bit more confident in it because you don't have to worry about getting rug pulled right away. So it just makes it everything a little bit easier. But for SPY this week, like I said, need to see it, you know, breaking out of this downtrend line. And I really feel like it could see a small rejection here if we open under this. Just a small one, obviously with volatility this low, VIX at 14s. I'm not expecting some Armageddon at the downtrend line. Need to see more evidence, have to see with my own eyes first. And then if it can get over that, like I said, max I could see is the supply zone. I just can't give you a higher reading than that until it gets over that. And if it can get over that, make a base kind of like this, then I can see the next one. It's going to be at 449, which is this supply zone right here. Above this supply, this little black area, this is free space up to the next supply. So that's why we need to see it get over that. And as well, your free space from this downtrend line is just up to 443 for this supply. And that's how you read the market, at least how I read the market. And you know, it can 
be a hit or miss. We can just blow through supply and it'll be like, oh, why do I even pay attention to supply? It's pointless. But one day you're going to wish you did pay attention to supply or big resistance points because you're going to buy there and they're going to rug pull you right there. That's why you wait for it to reject, then pull back. You buy the pullback or back test, then you get in and your second chance at the resistance, it's much easier to blow through it because the bears failed to keep it down. Simple as that. So for the spy this week, either it needs to pull into 438. If it pulls into 438, I'd be willing to buy the dip there, trade back up to the downtrend line. Simple as that. Or if it can get outside the downtrend line, trade up to 443. And that's about it. So 438 to 433 is the trading range for this week for me personally. That's what I'm going to be watching. Also depends on the Camarilla pivots. So if the Camarilla pivots look good, I'll buy the dip regardless. These are Camarilla pivots. They reset every single day. You can see the long setup for SPY on Friday was this R4 screen line up to R5. And that's where it tops out, R5. Uh, the Camarilla pivots stop at the 5. So it stops at S5 and stops at R5. And if you go watch my Camarilla pivot video, you'll definitely be able to day trade better. So R4 to R5 is the type of breakout long to the upside. And then also you can do an S3, which is down here up to R3. It's another type of long setup where you could do a R3 to S3 short. Obviously if volatility is a little bit lower and you feel more confident of downside, you could do that. This little R3 breakdown was a fake out. So always a hit or miss, especially when volatility is this low, you want to be careful shorting. But that's for the SPY. Like I said, it needs to either break out of the downtrend line, gives you room up to 443, or if it pulls or if it pulls down into 438, you can look to buy the dip there. If this falls under 438, obviously it takes you to 433. So that's for the SPY, big downtrend line here. Need to see what it does here. All right, and for QQQ, so last week we were actually closed. Okay, so we closed right here on Friday, so we had a little bit more room to tap the downtrend line, and we did that. You can see on Monday, we had just a brief, brief little sell-off off the downtrend line. This is uh, right on Monday. So you could have shorted right here this day and made a little bit of money. It wasn't anything crazy, though. Probably just better to sit out because the follow-through with the rejection really wasn't that much. And that was pretty much the downtrend line we were focused on last week. Either wanted to see, you know, uh, some type of rejection bar confirming that the downtrend line was going to go lower or we wanted to see a breakout. And we actually finally got the breakout right on Tuesday. And the max I felt good about seeing was uh, just 373 because I had no idea how it was going to react once it got there. And you could see exactly why. So this is 373 top resistance and we rejected off of it actually two days in a row. So we rejected it on Wednesday, also rejected it with this big bar on Thursday. And then once Friday was able to finally get over it, that was a straight shot up into supply. So this 373 breakout area and this black area right here, this is your free space up to supply. And that's kind of how you take it one level at a time. It's respecting technical analysis very well. So it gave bears their rejection, potential fake out. But then you have to also consider you got to test one, test two, test three, test four. This is a strong downtrend line. It finally broke out. It back tested off of the general area and then led to just a straight rip. So this is just a higher low back test off the downtrend line. We see them all the time in order to go higher. This week, closed right inside supply. If it does want to just you know carve through this, there's another point at 380. That's the max I could see for right now. I would need to see it get over 380 to go higher. And this could be a potential you know resistance area, at least short term. But like I said, the seasonality, we are coming to the midpoint of the month. So we could kind of see not really big trading ranges this week. VIX is at 14, so you just never know. And we'll go over the VIX next. The reason why Friday had such a big day is because I think Thursday it got up to 15. And once it got up to 1550s, it had a lot of room to retrace down. And I feel like that's why we got that big impulse move on Friday because the VIX was a little bit higher and that in return gave it more room to move down harder. But when the VIX is closing at lows like this down 7%, it makes it a little bit harder to expect big green days like this or big red days uh, like Thursday. So in my opinion, uh, I really probably wouldn't even short until up maybe at 380 and I'll look at a put scalp up there. But that's really about it. Obviously, if it can get back down to 373, which is uh, this little resistance area right here, if we could back test that, I'd be willing to buy the dip there. But otherwise, it might need to consolidate here and make a base before trying to go higher. And if it can start making a more solid base, kind of like what we saw last week, just consolidation, higher low, if we could see something like that, I'd be willing to buy the dip. But with one day candles like this, it's really hard to just buy into the FOMO. And it's also not the smartest move either. You know, you can get totally rug pulled after a big 2% rally like this. Lots of times price needs to consolidate. You need accumulation. You need more interest, more slow motion, people building up a position, and then you can see an impulse move. 
and kind of got that here. I mean, you got three, four days of consolidation on the SPY and the QQQ. QQQ was stronger, but you just still did have two days at least of consolidation before it had this big impulse move. So it's not just going to go straight up all the time is my point. So it either needs to get up to 380. You could, get up, you could look at a put scalp there, pull into 373, look at a dip buy there. Or if it wants to make a base up here more solid, at least one or two days, and it's not breaking down, that could also give you a base to go higher. Otherwise, I don't see it making a huge move until it gets over 380. 380 just takes you up to 387. There's also a little point right here. If you want to keep it simple, just mark the extreme points. You got an extreme high here, extreme high here, extreme high here. So 380, 384, 387, 98. Simple as that. Those are your three points of upside that you know could see some type of testing, but you need to see it get over 380 first to take you to 384. So you take it one level at a time, one day at a time, and you know don't keep your expectations too high. The lower you keep your expectations, the better it feels once you finally get that follow through on your analysis. So that's just a couple of scenarios, either, you know, get up to 380 max, could see some resistance there, or, you know, if we do pull back, I would buy at 373, but that's about it for QQQ. And last but not least, we're going over the VIX. And the reason why I'm going over the VIX is because we're starting to get to extreme lows. So I like to look at volatility when volatility is starting to get to extremes. And every single area you see with an arrow or some type of circle is a volatility extreme point. You got 2308, that's an extreme high. You got 1553, that's an extreme low or pretty much like a midpoint where it's rejected or acted as support. You got 2081, you got two major rejections right there. Uh, 1888, you got a big rejection point here. Acted as support right here. Cover that last week. Also rejected there. 1708, you get the idea. Anything with a circle and an arrow, I marked these last week just to make it more obvious so you guys can see, is a volatility extreme point. So just remember that. And it just makes it more clear and concise and you can see the extreme points. And you want to pay attention to volatility when it's in extremes or you want to pay attention to its one day extreme points. And every single one I have circled with an arrow is some type of extreme point where volatility went up aggressively, it went down aggressively, and it bounced aggressively or rejected aggressively. So this is what I was talking about earlier with why I think the SPY went up so high on Friday and why the impulse move is so big, despite you know VIX being pretty low. When VIX is this low, it's kind of hard to see those big 2% days, especially for tech or for SPY, just because the ATRs dry up. And sometimes you only see like half a percent to a percent, especially once it gets down to the 12s. But the reason why I think it went so high on Friday was because we had that big shoot up. It was up 6%. It went up to 1550s and look where it rejected. The next day, volatility crushed Friday. So I think because it got up to that extreme point, it was able to fall that hard and give SPY that much gas to have that impulse move. If the VIX closed low, very low on Friday, or I'm sorry, on Thursday, if it closed lower here, I don't think we would have had that big of a day on Friday. So because volatility went up so aggressively, it was able to give it more room to retrace down and it rejected off that extreme point. So that's why I think we had that big impulse move on Friday. As well as a lot of times on Friday, you'll see that VIX crush Friday. So not much has changed from last week. We're looking at this 1460 to 1410. So this was Friday's close. At about 1492, we closed at 1418. So almost a buck lower, but not completely. And I mentioned that 1460 to 1410, 1410 was a 2021 low. 1460 was just a wick area from right here back in August of 23. And look where it bounced right on Thursday. So it's just proving my point of these extreme points working and acting as support or resistance. You need to go to your shorter term time frame analysis to, you know, see these bounces or see this follow through off these levels. So if we go to the 15, you can see on Thursday, it wicked all the way down to 1413. So almost the 1410 basically. And then once we shot back over the 1460 right here at 1255 on Thursday, that's when volatility got aggressive and went up to 1553. But these are the points that I have marked on the one day. These are all one day levels. So that's why they work so good. So the velocity picked up aggressively over 1460. They give you a straight shot to 1550s. 1550s rejected hard. I actually bought the dip on SPY once they got up here, or this general area at least. Once it got up to 1550s, had a nice little bounce up, made like 25%. So once volatility gets to an extreme point, look for a rejection, you can maybe buy the dip. That's one way to use volatility or the VIX. So it's the same thing as last week. It needs to either get under 1410, 
And I said, if it got under 1410, it's just a straight shot down to 1273, or it needs to start closing back over the 1550s, which it failed to do that on Thursday. It got up there, but it didn't close. And then the next day is when we had the huge impulse move. So the failure to close over 1550s fails to make people convinced that volatility is coming back and they're not going to be as urgent to buy puts or hedge because it didn't get that important close over a volatility extreme point. Simple as that. So that's your major focus levels. 1553 needs to close over that for an actual volatility signal to go higher. Or if it starts flushing under 1410s, closing under that, that's a straight shot down to 1273 and you'll see this buy go higher more than likely. If it wants to keep holding and chopping here, it can act as support as well. Uh, 1410 is a 2021 major low. So, and then 1460, like I said, that's this little wick area right here where it bounced prior. Fire. It's probably why it had that big pop on Thursday because this can act as a support. So we need to see either the close under or the close over 1550s. Simple as that. Otherwise, this could keep acting as support short term, although I don't think it's likely by the looks of it. But, you know, anything can happen. This one day bar doesn't mean that it's, you know, completely bearish. It's still closed over the 14s. So, you know, anything could happen. But I feel like it uh, likely it's probably going to try to go lower over time just by looking at this. Uh, if we start closing over 1553 again, I would feel way more confident saying volatility is going to come back. So right now I feel like it's in a downtrend. It's, it's probably going to keep trying to go lower. So it makes it easier to buy the dips and not buy too much into these little volatility spikes. But if it starts getting over that 1553, like I said, definitely look for more. So that's for the VIX. That's your levels of focus. Close over 1553 gives you that signal up. Close under 1410 gives you that signal down and the market will probably go higher. So I love you guys. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our X Trades YouTube channel. I hope you found this educational as well as filled with value you can use to trade this week or even carry out some of these charting techniques or really anything up into your trading over a very long period of time. So go check out my other videos. I have videos on how to trade with moving averages, how to use camera little pivots for day trading, really all types of stuff for beginners. So go check it out. I love you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and get this chopped up, edited, and sent out. And I'm out.